take your Bibles with me and turn to Genesis chapter 1, if you would. Genesis chapter 1, last week we started in a new series that we've entitled Beyond Doubt, Navigating Faith in a Questioning World. Now, you remember last week we looked at sort of a very fundamental foundational question. How did we get here? And we talked about the fact that we're not a product of chance, we're not a product of, uh, you know, an accident or just merely natural laws taking their effect, but rather we are a special creation of God, that God in His infinite wisdom and power has created everything that there is, including you and me. Now this week, uh, we're going to kind of pick up on that theme. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, you'll notice something here that uh, we can we kind of sum that passage up under just real quickly by saying, first of all, as human beings, we are created in the image of God. We are made to have a relationship with Him, and we're unique. None of the other things that God created in the universe does He say are created in His image, but you and I are unique in that category. Not only that, he says, uh, and we're not going to get into this this morning to any great depth, but he created them with gender. He created them male and female. Now, I only mention that because we live in a world where even that is confused, where we're not sure even what the word gender means anymore or what it is. And then he also says that they were created with responsibility. You'll notice that he tells them that they are to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. He says, I'm going to give them a job. I'm going to give them responsibility. Later on, and we'll look at this in more depth in a few minutes, he gives them a choice. He gives them the ability to have a will and make decisions. And at this point, God has an assessment of man. Look what he says in verse 31. When he looks out over all of the universe, this is what God says about it at this point in Genesis. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, six times in chapter 1, in the previous verses, God has said that what he had made was good. The word good is the Hebrew word tob, and it's used to describe the, both the quality of creation as, long, as well as its moral condition. It was good in the sense that it, it was there and it was doing the very thing that God had created it to do. Uh, birds were singing and bees were being, and, and they were doing all the things. Man was, was following him. Everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. For man, it carried the idea of a moral quality, that we were pleasing to God. In fact, when God finishes and creates man, he indicates that we are the pinnacle of his creation by adding one little word there. Did you notice? He didn't say it was just good. He said it was very good. And so when we look at it, we've been talking about, you guys have got to meet our uh, interns this summer. Jack is back uh, on his way home, um, and, and we've talked about, you know, we've had some, some good interns. I would say that this year, by the way, you've been very good interns. You guys have done very well. It raises that level. That's what God says of creation. That's his assessment here at the end of Genesis chapter 1. But I want you to Turn with me just a few more pages in your Bible, and I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 6. And I want to let you see what God's assessment was just a very short time later, just a few chapters, maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand years. We actually don't know how much time there was between Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 6, but presumably it's not very long. We get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Now listen to God's assessment. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, 
and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Chapter one, God says everything is very good. It is pristine. It is exactly the way God intended. By the time we got to chapter six, things have gotten so bad that God says, I wish that I would have never created them, and he sends judgment in this form of a flood. What in the world happened? If you go back and you look at Scripture, you'll see very quickly that, that the problem that came into the world was the problem of sin. And with sin came suffering. This week, we're going to tackle one of the most difficult and challenging objections to the Christian faith that exist. Um, the question is, why is there evil and suffering in our world? This goes back even predates Christianity. If we want to try to understand this objection, we could take it all the way back. And the first place where we really see this objection being raised is uh, some 300 years before Jesus even came along, a Greek a uh, philosopher named Epicurus, I, you don't have to remember that name, but he raised this question. It's called the Epicurean Paradox, and this is the way he said it. He said, um, he said that if God is, is God willing to prevent evil but not able, then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is neither, if he is neither able or willing, then why call him God? A more modern statement of that came from Dan Story, not the fellow that you know that uh, was a member here, but a uh, fellow that wrote a book uh, called Defending Your Faith. He's a Christian apologist, and he said it this way, the problem of evil has been called the Achilles heel of Christianity. Simply put, it claims that the God of Christianity is inconsistent and incompatible with the world around us. Christians claim that God is an all-powerful, loving being, yet evil and suffering are rampant in the world. How do these facts mesh? We hear that objection all the time. It is raised almost every day. Uh, one writer, Sam Harris, who is an atheist, said it this way, the problem of evil is the most potent argument against the existence of God. It is the only argument that I'm aware of that suggests not just that God is unlikely, but that he is impossible. We hear it raised all the time. When we see images like this, Now that last one. That's the epitome of all suffering right there, brothers and sisters. I apologize if you're a Cubs fan and, and I pray for you, all right? Actually, I'm not a baseball fan at all, so I have no dog in that fight. But we raise that question. We see suffering all around us and the question is, how can an all-powerful, loving God allow that to go on? And many have walked away from the faith going, I, I can't answer that question. Now we need to understand something. Last week I talked to you about a worldview that we hear a great deal about. We call it naturalism. That's the scientific worldview today that says we can explain everything by the scientific method. And, it, and you know the scientific method says we were here by a product of chance of the Big Bang and evolution and all of these things came along and that's why we're here. And it says that we can explain everything by simple natural laws. Now the naturalist, when he faces the problem of evil and suffering, while they're very quick to raise this objection, they have no answer for it themselves. The reality is, in their worldview, evil and suffering are simply the result of human nature, and that's all. There's no good or evil, there's just things that happen. It, there's no morality in naturalism. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do, because it's survival of the fittest. 
Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous atheists of the 21st century, said this, blindness to suffering is an inherent consequence of natural selection. Nature is neither kind nor cruel, but indifferent. He says, when we look out at the suffering in the world, none of it really matters. Now, you and I know it does matter. <laughs> when you're sick, and when you lose a loved one, and you're going through a crisis and a difficult moment in your life, you know that suffering does matter. So how do we explain it? As Christians, how do we understand this problem of why there is so much rampant evil? Listen, let's be honest, and I don't want to get into any great depth on this, but we saw it yesterday. Did we not? We saw it yesterday, the tempted life on a candidate for the President of the United States' life. And while that is horrible, we also need to remember a man died. It's a horrible world that we live in. We see it all around us, everywhere we look, evil and suffering. So what's the answer? Well, the Bible has already taught us a little bit. We've already seen that when God made the world, he made it absolute pristine, and in that first moments, there's no evil. But the Bible tells us something, that when God created us in his image, he gave us the ability to make a choice. You see that in Genesis chapter 2. If you want to flip over there, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, God expands on this, and he says in verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I want you to notice something that God does there. He gives a commandment, and it's very clear. He says, you have a choice. You have all of these trees out there that you can eat from. There's this one right here in the middle of the garden, and he aptly names it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, that one you can't eat. And you know the rest of the story probably. The Bible records that in chapter 3 of Genesis that the serpent comes along, Satan comes along, and tempts Eve. And Eve chooses to rebel against God in sin. Now, the next part gets even worse. Adam, who is the head of the entire human race, theologians call him the federal head, he is the one from which all of us descend, who represents all of mankind, chooses then, knowing exactly what God had said, and with his eyes wide open, choose, the Bible makes it very clear, by the way, Eve was deceived. Adam sinned intentionally. There's a big difference in that, is there not? If you have a little kid, I look at Max sometimes, we tell Max, don't do certain things. When he knows the rule, and we've told him, don't do that, and he does it, then there has to be a punishment attached to it. Now, if he doesn't know something, if he does something out of, purely out of ignorance, well, we don't attach a punishment to that. We're, we're going to try to correct that behavior, make sure he understands what's right or wrong. Adam knew the moment that he ate the fruit that he was rebelling against God. He's doing it with his eyes wide open. That's why the Bible pins this responsibility upon him. Now, that brought immediate consequences. If you go down through Genesis chapter 3, you find out the very first thing that happens after they sin is sin or shame and fear enter into the equation. In chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Immediately they recognized not only... Now, was God a danger? That's why they're hiding from them. But they now regard each other as being dangerous. And so they're ashamed and they hide themselves with clothes. We see it brings separation from God. In chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves. Now, stop and think about that for a minute. Up until that point, they had perfect union with God. 
And presumably, God had this practice of coming down and meeting regularly with Adam and Eve, and that would have been cool, wouldn't it? But now when they hear God, they run from him. They're afraid of him. There is a break in that relationship between God and man. There's a separation between each other. You all know this, this part. God says, uh, Adam, what did you do? And Adam, like all good husbands, blamed his wife. And then he blamed God. The wife, the woman you gave me, God, she made me do it. What's happened there? Now that seems kind of funny to us in one sense, but you understand, we live in a world where no one takes responsibility for evil. No one, no one. We say what we wanna say and we think we could say anything and it doesn't matter and it does. We can do whatever we wanna do and it doesn't matter, it does. We have to accept responsibility. Adam doesn't accept responsibility for it. It brings physical death and hardship. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God had told them, if you eat of this tree, you are going to surely die. And in chapter 3, we find out, then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now let us reach it. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And what's he do? He places a, a guard there to keep us from having that life. Death came into the world. Romans makes that very clear. Why did death come into the world? Because of Adam's sin. But the Bible makes it very clear that as a result of that, all of the moral corruption that we see in our world came in as a result of that. Immediately. If you go and read the Bible, you see this decline of man happen so rapidly, it's almost startling. He creates Adam and Eve in chapters 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 3, they sin. Chapter 4, the third man on the earth kills the fourth man on the earth. By the end of chapter 5, you have a man named Lamech who is bragging not only about polygamy, taking more than one wife, which God never uh, endorsed, and he is bragging about he's killed a two people. By the end of chapter 5, we have a litany of over and over again, God talking about the person lived and they died, and there's records of evil among many of those folks. By the time we get to chapter 6, God says, I'm sorry I ever made them. I'm sorry I ever made them. See, when we look and we answer the question of why is there evil in the world, it's because of us. It's because of us. We sin. And when we look at the evil and the suffering and the problems of our world, see, here's the thing. You have to understand that sin is the cause and suffering and all of this other stuff is the effect. Prior to Adam's sin, there was no suffering in the world. Uh, now, I don't know what happened. Somebody asked me that one time. They said, well, what happened if Adam was walking through the woods one day and stubbed his toe? Did it hurt? Well, yes, it hurt. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you didn't see the kind of death and destruction and disease in the garden prior to Adam's sin. Sin brought all of the suffering of the world. People say, why do people suffer today? It's because we live in a broken, fallen world. Now, God knew all that was going to happen. God created a world, and I don't completely understand this. I'm just going to be honest with you. Can we, is it okay sometimes for us to just to say, I don't completely understand this? I know what the Bible says about it, coach but I can't completely understand everything he did here. But he, he teaches us that God in his infinite wisdom knew that it was better to create man with the ability to choose knowing that he would choose to sin. And knowing that that sin would bring in evil and corruption and suffering, but then give them the opportunity to choose whether or not they would come back and follow him. Somehow, in the economy of God, he works that out. And, and the evidence of that is what we find in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, we, well, in fact, in the entire Bible, by the way, we see the fulfillment of in the New Testament. 
God does not just abandon man. If God simply created man and said, I'm going to give you the choice to sin, and I know you're going to sin, but I'm just a cruel, malevolent, nasty person, and I just want to see you suffer. That's not a God worthy of your time. But that's not what God did. God said, I'm going to create a world, and I know that you're going to choose to do evil, and I know it's going to hurt, but I'm going to offer you redemption. I'm going to give you the opportunity to freely choose me. So what does he do? He sends his son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross and to redeem us. Now, you may think, preacher, that is a too simplistic of an answer to this problem. Stop and think. God himself, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, did not ignore your suffering. He entered into your suffering. He experienced every temptation, all of the difficulties, all of the challenges. He endured suffering and sin on your behalf so that he could then set you free. That's what, he didn't ignore it. He didn't just act like it wasn't there. He came and he dealt with it. So how do we as believers then handle evil and suffering? Well, let me give you some things. First of all, you need to know that God has a bigger plan. This is hard. This is hard. But you need to know that in the midst of whatever you're going through and whatever suffering and whatever difficulty, God has a plan. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy, uh, worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There's a lot in that verse. One thing it's telling us is that when Adam sinned, listen to me, the entire created universe was affected. It didn't just affect him, it affected the actual physical created universe. But he says, when we look forward and we see what is coming in the future, our present suffering is not even worth comparing. You stop me to think about that. I, the, the easiest illustration that I can think about with that is an athlete. About this, I, I drove pulling out of the parking lot the other day, and I saw Coach Glass and all, all of the guys over there coaching uh, the, uh, the Pee Wee football team over there. And uh, boy, they look pretty good, Coach. Uh, they, they all they look like a real football team over there. Boy, I tell you what, all through the next few weeks, those football players are going to endure difficult. Coach is going to be out there yelling and screaming at them like a madman. He'll be making them run laps. They're going to think they're going to die. They're going to think this is the worst suffering I've ever been through. Now, probably not, because Coach is a pretty nice guy. They're going to go, but they're going to have to physically train themselves. Jacob, you play basketball. Caitlin, you play things. I don't know what they are. Uh, you play basketball too? Basketball and, and other things. Well, you got to go out for basketball. They're going to make you run suicides, right? You like running suicides? No. Uh, I'm looking at Qualsic and talking to Jacob. I just wrote it in my glasses on. Well, Kwasik, you got an answer for this too, right? Because he's a, this guy here, he's a kickboxer. You know what he does for fun? He gets into a ring and lets people kick him. That's nuts. Hard to train for that, isn't it? Got to go through a lot of suffering. But when you win the bout, or you win the basketball game, or coach, when you win the football game, is it worth it? Yes. You endure the momentary suffering because you know what's coming down the road. Well, listen to me. As a believer, you know this. Anything you're going through in this life, God is preparing you for something greater in glory. Amen? And he didn't promise it would be easy because this is just preparation for eternity. We're going to live here 70, 80, 90. If you're Jigs Whalen, you live to be 104. Uh, you know, uh, you live a, a short period of time in comparison with eternity. God says you got to know that he's got a bigger 
plan. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Did you hear that? Paul says in those verses that if you are a believer, you will suffer with Jesus. That is part of your assurance that you are Say, boy, I'd love to tell you, when you get saved, it all gets easy. Listen, man, when you get saved, you have hope and you have assurance of salvation and you have forgiveness of your sins and you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You got the word of God to guide you. You got a church to help you and fellowship with. But I'm going to tell you something, you still will have hard moments. There will be moments when it hurts not only physically, but sometimes emotionally and sometimes spiritually. But the Bible says that's part of your insurance. And know that God has a greater plan for you down the future. He's working that. Listen, I like to say this, and I hope you hear this. God never wastes suffering. Do you understand that? He doesn't waste it. When suffering comes and he allows it to come, and we can see that in scripture, can we not? Well, I'm getting fired up here. I don't know if this chair is going to hold me much longer, all right? But, but the, the bottom line is, we know that he does. Let me give you examples. He took the Jewish people in the Old Testament, and they had to endure the Babylonian captivity. Do you think that was easy? No, that was hard. They had to go, when they left Exodus, they had to go and wander 40 years in the wilderness. Why? God was preparing for them. Was it easy? No, they suffered. They struggled. They had a difficult time. If you want to see suffering, go to the cross. Jesus went to the cross. Did it hurt? Yes. Was it agonizing? Yes. Not only did he endure the physical uh, problem of, of our existence, but he also endured this, the, the spiritual separation from God on the cross. Why? So that he could reconcile us. God allows suffering for a moment, but he always has a purpose in it. He always has a plan. Now, I can't tell you for sure what God's plan is for the particular suffering you're going through this moment. I can't. Wouldn't that have been great if they'd have given me that answer in seminary? Wouldn't it have been just walked up and said, here you go, there's the answers. I, he doesn't tell us the specifics. But he promises there is a plan. And there is a purpose. And one of these days, I don't know if when we get to heaven, if we're going to have to sit down and have a long conversation with God and say, well, let me ask you, why did this happen? Why on this date did you let this thing occur? I don't know. Maybe we will be able to do that. Maybe it won't matter. I have a feeling. This is, can I give you my Job Buchanan theory for just a moment? Can, can, and I think I can biblically support this. The Bible says in Revelation that when we get to heaven, he will wipe away every tear. I do not think that means that he makes it so we don't remember. I think it be, it's because he helps us to understand. Standing in heaven for the first time in my life, I'll be able to see from the beginning to the end at every point in the middle and I'll understand everything that Jesus wanted me to become. And I'll understand how he got me to that point. And it will all make sense. I'll finally understand it. I don't understand it right now. That's okay. You know, we have to tell Max a lot of things he don't understand. We have to tell him. I had to tell him the other day, don't put Legos in your nose. That's a weird conversation to have to have with any other human being, is it not? But when you're talking to a three-year-old who thinks Legos are the answer to everything, and he's sitting there, and literally, that's what he was doing. He's just, Papa, I can't get it. He didn't say that, but Max, those don't go in your nose. He don't understand that. That don't make any sense to him. One day it will. We're like that three-year-old right now. We don't understand it, but God has a plan. He reminds us that we have to keep an eternal perspective. We live trapped inside. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week. The Bible teaches us that God is eternal. 
I don't know about you, that is an endlessly fascinating subject for me to think about. I don't know, do you ever just sit around and think about God is eternal? Maybe you know, I'm weird. But I think it's one of the most amazing things that the Bible tells us. Revelation says it this way, he is the alpha and the omega. He is at the beginning and he is at the end. Here's the weird part about God. God doesn't experience time the way you and I do. He sees time all at once. The beginning and the end are all just one big moment for God. He sees it all. But for you and me, we are experiencing it. And it helps us to back away from this for a moment. My my dad, one of the favorite songs that he used to sing was we'll understand it all by and by. I can still remember getting ready for church and hearing my dad. My dad sang worse than I do. I'd give a million dollars to listen to him sing one last time, but I'd be sitting in my room getting ready to go to church. My dad would be getting dressed and he'd be singing, we'll understand it all by and by. It's a reminder to us. We live in this one moment and I can't see it all. Right now, death dominates our world. Genesis 2, 17 tells us that. But but one day, death is going to be defeated. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Isn't that a wonderful truth? No more death. Now, Satan rules and and deceives us. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. But but there's going to be a day down in the future in Revelation chapter 20 where the Bible says, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. He's going to be defeated. Right now, pain is a part of everyday life. Anybody have pain? Boy, if you don't have pain and you want to explain just sit out there. There's a group of old guys that stand up. Ricky Bunch is going to punch me for calling him an old guy. There's a bunch of fellas, young bucks that stand out in front of our coffee pot out here on Sunday morning. And you'll learn some wisdom from those guys if you listen long enough. That's what they tell me. But you stand around there and talk to a bunch of folks, and before too long, what are we talking about? If me and coach get together, what are we talking about very long? How's your, co- how's your, how's your shoulder, coach? How's your knee, coach? How's your back, Joe? How's this? We, that's what we talk about. Come to the average prayer meeting. I, I won't say this happens in our prayer meetings as much anymore. I, I've been to prayer meetings that sound more like an organ recital. We're praying for this guy's kidney, that guy's gout, this guy's liver, that guy's adenoids. Um, we're praying. We know it. Pain, part of everyday life. But Revelation says in chapter 21, verse 4, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither there shall be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain. One of these days, it'll all be gone. Now the curse of sin affects every aspect of our life. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, he lays out all the curse. But one of these days, All of those limitations, all of those struggles will be gone. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in it, and his servants will worship them. Right now, God's presence is somewhat restricted and somewhat veiled. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, he removes himself from the garden and he sets a cherubim up there to protect the way to it. But in Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, the Bible says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. I love that. One of these days, all of that separation from God will be removed. We'll see him face to face. Then the barriers are going to be removed. God tells us, listen, it might be rough right now. It might be hard. You live in a fallen and broken world. But one of these days, it's all going to be okay. Amen? One of these days, it's all going to be good. All of those pains, all of those struggles, all of those difficulties. You know, there are moments. How many of you have ever asked this question? God, why'd you make me this way? Anybody ever asked that question? You're not going to raise your hand because if you ask that question, you don't want anybody to know. But yeah, you ever asked that question? Why'd you make me this way? I ask myself that question a lot of times. 
God, why'd you make me that way? Why, why, why did one in heaven, we're going to understand all of that? He said, I'm going to remove all that evil and suffering. It's momentary. It's light in comparison with the glory of heaven. He gives us a third thing that we have to do. We have to respond to God's solution. Listen to me. When Adam and Eve sinned, they brought, they, when rebelled against God, they brought sin, they brought evil, they brought suffering, they brought all of the trouble, not only into the world, into the entire universe. They corrupted everything. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that God sent Jesus to deal with the curse of sin. You can find a lot of verses that would teach that. My favorite is John 3, 16. I know it's like being simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God said, listen, I gave you free choice. You ruined it. You sinned. You broke that fellowship. But I'm going to respond. I'm going to send my son into the world. And here's what Jesus did. He went to the cross and he took all of your sin. He took all of the guilt of your sin and he paid the penalty in full. That'd be like if I did something wrong and they were going to throw me in jail and Jared came down and said, I'll take Joe's place. Or coach came down and said, I'll take Joe's place. That's the same thing that Jesus did. He came down. What did we deserve? We deserve separation from God. We deserve to be separated from him and go to hell. But the Bible says Jesus came and he paid the penalty. But did you notice there? He said, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now I understand that there is a mystery here concerning the sovereignty of God and the will of man. But I will tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that we have to place our trust in him. There was a moment in my life when I was a 10-year-old boy that I had heard the gospel and it was time for me to make a decision. I had to respond. I had to turn away from my sin and trust Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Now, did God immediately take all of the suffering and pain out of my life? No, he did not. Did he give me hope and assurance that one day he will? Yes, he did. He is telling us that if you want life, if you want forgiveness, it comes just as Adam made a choice and rebelled against God. Now we make a response to turn away from sin and trust him. You're not trusting, by the way, in a prayer. You're not trusting in walking forward. Those are things that I'm going to invite you to do in just a few moments. But I want, to hear, want you to hear this. It's not just saying words. It's believing them in your heart. When you trust him, he forgives you. He cleanses you. That's why in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. What we earn by our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He gives us life. He gives us hope. Yes, we live in a broken world. It's a broken world because sin has entered into God's good creation. But God has sent his son to redeem us and to reconcile. And you know what the Bible says? This is what he says here in Colossians. And um, I'm going to have to put my passcode in now. There'll be no passcodes in heaven, I don't think. All right. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, this is what he says. For in him, that's in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. God says through Jesus, he's going to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind by doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. I don't know why our individual uh, suffering happens. I do know why suffering happens from the big picture. We've sinned. And I know this, that God sent his son to die for us. If you're here today, I want to ask you this. Has there been a moment in your life where you've trusted him? And so this is the most important decision we make. We make a lot of important decisions. Let's just face it. 
We have a lot going on in our nation, obviously. And we could talk for hours about it and not solve a single one of those problems. All of those problems come from this thing. We are alienated from God. And what God wants more than anything else, and what you need and I need more than anything else, is to be brought back into that relationship with him. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you've turned from your sin. I'm not asking you, did you have your name on the church roll or have you been baptized or have you done anything? Has there ever been a moment where you turned from your sin and you trusted him? If there's not, the Bible says you're still separated from God. God's remedy is very simple. Repent and trust him. And the moment you do that, your life can change. Amen? Your life can change. We've watched it time and time and time again. I was sitting there the other day. I was at a funeral the other day, and I was looking out across the room, and many of the folks I knew have been believers for a long, long time. Some of them I, I knew when they were still in their sin. And I've watched how God changed their lives. He can change you. Listen, if he can change Carl Stewart, he can change you. Amen? Amen? I'm not joking around. Carl was a rough, weird dude back in the day. Sinful. But God saved him and changed him. If God can save me or if he can save Cliff or if he can save Jared or Coach or, or anybody else in this room, he can save you. Would you come? Give your heart and your life to him. Turn from your sin, repent, and put your faith and trust in him.